Well, thanks very much, Michael. Uh, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and I'm proud to lead a government that's committed to the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. And I take the opportunity to express my thanks to the business community, including BHP, uh, for the extraordinary level of support uh, that is there to get this done, to recognise First Nations people in our birth certificate going forward. Uh, I, I could do a, a, a shorter Prime Minister's speech and just say uh, what Mike Henry said, uh, because I, I, I did agree with every single word in which he, he put forward and I thank him uh, for the relationship that he has developed uh, with uh, myself on a personal level but uh, with so many business uh, leaders. Uh, later today I will be on my way to India and I'll be joined on that trip by 25 CEOs and business leaders across transport, resources, finance, higher ed, architecture and energy. One of the biggest and most significant Australian business delegations to ever visit any of our trading partners. Australia and India are Indo-Pacific partners through the Quad and I'm looking forward to hosting the Quad Leaders Summit that will be held uh, in coming months. Our two nations share a very rich history. We're bound by our democratic values and enlivened by genuine friendship, but also as we're seeing uh, at uh, cricket grounds, fierce sporting rivalry, and I look forward to uh, attending uh, half an hour anyway of the uh, the fourth test, along with Prime Minister Modi, in a couple of days' time. By any measure, Australia is a better place because of our large, diverse, and aspirational Indian Australian community, the fastest growing group uh, in Australia. Yet, for all of this. In 2021-22, India was only Australia's sixth largest goods and services trading partner. Now we can elevate that, and not just by volume. Our government is seeking to deepen and diversify Australia's trade links. Greater diversity in who we trade with and greater variety in what we trade, meaning our economy is more resilient and more secure. One in four Australian jobs are related to international trade. I am determined to create more jobs in export industries and broaden our export base so that more Australian businesses, big and small, can find markets for their products and services overseas. If you look at India, they have set ambitious goals for 50% renewable energy by 2030 and 30% electric vehicles by the same year. Now, Australia can help realise those goals, and not just as a supplier of critical minerals, but as a provider of technology and services, mining equipment, software and systems expertise, training and skills, and value-added products made in Australia, batteries and storage and charging technology, the next generation of solar panels, electrolyzers, and zero carbon fertilizers through green ammonia. And in resources too, green steel and green aluminium and green iron. The point that is always worth making here is that this is not a zero sum game. We can do all of these things as well as remain a trusted and reliable supplier of energy to key trading partners such as Japan, and the Republic of Korea, as well as supporting their transition to cleaner sources such as green hydrogen. Australia has the natural advantages to make this happen. We can be a global provider of choice in the resources, research and expertise that will drive the world to net zero. But as every business person in this audience understands, Natural advantages are no guarantee of success. Securing the next generation of Australian prosperity depends on making the right investments in our workforce, our infrastructure, our productivity and our innovation. Because the world isn't waiting for us. And doing things the way we've always done them before, just because that's the way they've always been done, doesn't ensure stability 
it only guarantees decline. In the last few years, global shocks have presented us with a series of nation, national wake-up calls. And Michael's um, quite uh, scary at times introduction about what has happened and how fast the world has moved with the timing of these conferences was a, a reminder of that. Uh, we've seen we are vulnerable when we are the last link in a global supply chain. We've seen our national energy grid is simply out of date and our energy market more exposed than it should be to movements in international prices. We've seen that our cyber security systems in government as well as in corporate Australia, are not at the level they need to be. And we've seen the flaws and weaknesses in our national skills base, the over-reliance on temporary migration exposed by our closed borders. All of this has come at a cost. It's driven up inflation, it's hurt family budgets, and it's increased business costs. And it's shown us the extraordinary pressures on our public hospitals and aged care sector. The worst thing that Australia could do, the most expensive mistake our nation could make, would be to ignore all of those warnings. To dismiss what's happened as a once in a century event and assume that things will gently just return to normal. We have before us a window of opportunity, a chance for genuine renewal and reform to deliver greater economic security by investing in our sovereignty, our capacity to stand on our own two feet, to build lasting energy security by upgrading our energy grid, reducing our emissions and reducing our energy costs, and to create stronger job security for people by investing in the skills and training and innovation that drive productivity. But we do have to move fast because other countries have seen the same science. Economies around the world are embarked on a new wave of investment in their own advanced manufacturing capacity. And they're seeking new productivity gains through investment in R&D and skills and science and technology. Governments and businesses here in Australia have to do the same. And that's the idea at the heart of our National Reconstruction Fund based on the proven success of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. This is a model for enhancing private sector capital investment and delivering a return on taxpayer dollars, boosting our nation's capacity to make things here again and enabling businesses to add more value here. We are determined to also legislate our safeguard mechanism to provide business and industry with a clear, stable and long-term framework for reducing emissions. Everyone recognises that the global transition to net zero will take time. Equally, we understand there is no time to waste. The work of transition will require massive investment in building new physical assets and modifying existing ones. And this is where gas in particular has a key role to play. As a flexible source of energy, providing peaking power today and continuing to provide firming power, helping to smooth the transition to renewables while guaranteeing energy security both for Australia as well as for our partners in the region. And when businesses have to make capital decisions over five and 10 and 20 year timeframes, it is so important that they can look to government for the confidence and certainty of a stable foundation and a long-term vision. Not the sort of chopping and changing that saw the Liberals and Nationals announce 22 different energy policies without actually landing a single one. Including, I might add, the very safeguard mechanism that they are now seeking to oppose. We're acting to upgrade Australia's energy security, but we're also acting on cyber security. Cyber security is as essential and as important for business as a lock on the door. It's vital to protecting your intellectual property, your client's privacy and your customer's confidence. Threats like cyber criminal activity are fast moving and rapidly evolving. But for too long, the capacity of government and business has been off the pace. 
Now we're determined to change that and we're determined to do it together. That's why last week we brought together business and civil society and intelligence agencies and the public service to inform a comprehensive and coordinated cyber security strategy. And I thank those in this room like Jennifer Westacott who participated in that process. And with this same focus on greater long-term security, we are reforming our migration program, returning the emphasis to permanent residency and citizenship. We're also making Infrastructure Australia, uh, very dear to my heart as you'd be aware, a serious, rigorous body again. Moving away from the partisanship and short-termism so we can get Commonwealth investment flowing into a pipeline of productivity enhancing projects that create jobs and train apprentices and boost our economy. And last month, we tasked the Productivity Commission to map out the path to universal affordable childcare. Important the day before, International Women's Day, to emphasise that this isn't just something that's a nice thing to do. It is economic reform. Universal, affordable childcare is an investment in early education in the next generation that the world is making. But importantly, it is an economic reform that will boost workforce participation, productivity and population. The three P's of economic growth while taking pressure of family budgets. I've said before that business has been ahead of government in so many areas over the last decade. More engaged in more parts of our region. More alive to the global challenge of climate change and the global opportunity of renewables and clean energy technology. And I have no doubt there are leaders in this room who have driven company-wide, even sector-wide initiatives that our government can take lessons from. My colleagues and I didn't come to office with a sense of entitlement. We don't imagine that we hold a monopoly on good ideas. We want to work with business to get things done for the good of the nation. Last year's Jobs and Skills Summit, which many of you made a valuable contribution to, stands as proof of that. Those two days of discussions produced agreement on 36 immediate outcomes, which we acted quickly to deliver. We've increased the permanent migration intake to 195,000. Additional investment in visa processing to tackle the extraordinary backlog a million people in the queue that we inherited. The creation of Jobs and Skills Australia to identify and anticipate workforce demand now and into the future. Industrial relations reform to encourage employers and employees being able to sit down and negotiate improvements in productivity and pay. Expanding paid parental leave, something that we didn't take to the election, but something that uh, the Jobs and Skills Summit said was a priority, but also making it more flexible. Uh, legislation that passed the Senate yesterday. And a national skills agreement signed by every state and territory to create 180,000 fee-free TAFE places this year. And as I've uh, roamed around the country, uh, in Perth last week, for example, of their 18,000 places, more than 14,000 had already been taken up, uh, creating huge opportunity. There are Australians enrolled in new courses, training for good jobs in areas of national priority right now as a result of that agreement. And work is well underway in other areas, including creating new digital apprenticeships in the public service and improving workforce participation opportunities for people with disability. Not all of these ideas came from within government. Not all of these policies were policies we took to the election. Neither was the energy price relief plan. We agreed with every state and territory government to shield Australian business and Australian households from the worst of global price spikes. But what these things have in common is that they recognise and meet an urgent national need and they set us up for a more secure future over the long term. 
Through a wasted decade, the previous government ignored the wake-up calls and the warnings, and they shot down every alternative because it suited their pathology of political conflict. We are determined to leave that pattern of neglect and crisis and hurried announcement behind. We've put a priority on orderly process, on debate informed by evidence and experts. Because we understand that to deliver reform, people need to know where you are coming from as well as where you want to go. So when my colleagues come to you as business leaders seeking your input, be assured it is not for the sake of it or the look of it. It's not to pad out a report to put on the shelf. We want you involved and engaged in the work of change and reform. Of course, that doesn't mean I expect us to agree on every element of every initiative. No reform that's worth doing is wholly uncontested. But I think we all come to this conversation with the understanding that turning away from this window of opportunity, hitting snooze on this wake-up call, settling for a slow decline as the world forges ahead, is simply not good enough. Our government has every confidence that Australia can rise to this moment. And we are determined to continue working with business and unions with civil society, policy experts, and a reinvigorated public service to seize the opportunities ahead of our nation, deepening and intensifying our international investment and trade links, taking our place as a clean energy superpower, revitalising advanced manufacturing in our regions, training Australians to lead in cyber capability and technology, and building an economy that embraces innovation and flexibility and equality for women to draw on the talent of our whole population. In all of this, business has a vital and essential role to play. And I look forward to engaging with you in the years ahead. Thanks very much. Thanks, Prime Minister. Um, my name is uh, Phil Curry. I'm the political editor of the AFR, and uh, we'll, we've got time for a quick, quick Q&A with the PM before he has to get back uh, to Parliament. So, uh, again, appreciate your time. This is the first time the summit has overlapped with a, with a sitting, sitting day. So. I can give you a lift back. <laughs> I've got to stay for Peter Dutton. <laughs> um, so this is your... The office stands. <laughs> <laughs> So this is your fourth business summit, PM, but, oh, sorry, but your first as Prime Minister. You've done three, I think, as opposition leader. So if I could just begin with the speech. Um, I think I might have done some as infrastructure minister too. Oh, so. definitely. There you go. A while ago. You, you could interview yourself. Um, we, <laughs> um, if I could just go to the speech um, before we get into the broader issues. Um, you, sort of, you talk about the, <clears throat> the challenges and the, and the exposures uh, of COVID the, in the economy, the things that now have been laid bare and need to be fixed. You talk about energy security and the, vo the volatile energy market, and in doing so, you go out of your way to mention the role of gas in the transition. That's a, a big topic in Parliament at the moment with you trying to get the legislation for the safeguard mechanism through. The Greens, some of the independent senators uh, are railing against the ongoing use of gas and want you to pretty much rule out any, any or ban any new gas projects. Is your message today sort of deliberately aimed at that uh, as much as uh, the engineering reality of energy? Or? It's just aimed at where, where we're coming from, being, being straight. Mm. And being straight, uh, gas will play a role uh, in renewables. Um, uh, a, a company, I don't know if they're, they're, they're here or not, um, but uh, I, I assume they are somewhere, like uh, Rio, what they want to do in Gladstone. Uh, with their alumina refinery and other uh, activity. They, they want to move towards hydrogen. Um, they want to move towards renewables and to power that, but they need the firming capacity of gas. And that is the case for so many um, companies as they, they move towards uh, net zero, where, where they want to be. Um, so I think... Uh, my concern as well, I guess, my, my message is twofold. Uh, that a, a message to the Greens and others that 
uh, for all of the rhetoric, um, if it doesn't stack up, if it has a negative impact, then uh, you're not actually helping the transition of what you say your objectives are. And to the government as well, I mean, for goodness sake, this is a safeguard mechanism that was put in place by Tony Abbott. Uh, how the, uh, the coalition can say they are a credible uh, organisation concerned with business and oppose something that business is crying out for, that certainty. Um, I, I believe in markets. Uh, government has a role, though, in setting frameworks to facilitate private sector activity. And this is the perfect example. The safeguard mechanism is supported universally. I, I don't know an opponent uh, in the business community, uh, in the resources sector, in any of these areas that require that certainty going forward. If you have that certainty, you will see the investment flow in, uh, but you need that framework. And gas is a part of that. Well, following on from that, in principally, A, would you be opposed uh, you know, to, to, to ensure the transition to, to a new gas field or an expanded gas field if that was what was required over the next few decades? I, I firmly believe that uh, those decisions uh, should be based upon uh, the return on capital uh, that private sector make. The government's role is to uh, set a framework, but also to obviously have proper environmental assessment based upon the merits of projects. Governments have a role to do that. Um, but uh, we, we will need, uh, in uh, coming years, we will need a, additional supply. And for all of the rhetoric of, uh, of my predecessors, nothing happened in that decade. Nothing. There wasn't a project. Okay, thanks Pam. Well, <clears throat> as my editor Michael Stutchbury mentioned in, in the opening speech, you, you, um, you were here last year, you, there was a wariness in, in the business community about um, you know, a Labor government among some sections, you spoke about your willingness to work with business, you mentioned the, Hawke Keat, the spirit of Hawke Keating and you've, that was sort of the broader theme of your speech today um, and you hark back to the, the Jobs and Skills Summit, um, one of the big, I guess, it, developments from that was the industrial relations changes. A lot of business leaders at that summit, some of them felt like that was already locked in before the summit, uh, felt a little bit ambushed. You've got, a, um, you've got another big IR agenda coming up um, for the second half of this year. We're looking at uh, labour hire, uh, the gig economy, uh, wage theft, things like that. There's a lot of nervousness, I know, in the mining sector and the airlines and retail about labour hire. Uh, how do you... How do you envisage nuancing that through uh, with business and getting the balance right? Having a straight conversation, um, being honest about it, uh, which uh, w which we're being. If uh, if if labour hire is used simply to drive down wages, uh, that's a bad thing. If labour hire is used for uh, specific purposes. Uh, you know, companies need uh, to have uh, contract things out, uh, then that is a, a good thing, that's a necessary thing. Um, but uh, when you look at uh, economic insecurity, uh, business has very much an interest in uh, working people having a stake in the system. And if you look at what's happened uh, in um, I uh, say in, uh, in, in front of uh, uh, the, the ambassador, um, in, in some parts of the disenfranchisement that led to a previous election in the United States, I think, uh, was uh, people in industrial areas feeling like they just had been left behind and not having a stake in the system. Uh, you know, the sort of uh, anger and dysfunction and division. Um, in Australia, we haven't had that. Uh, we haven't had people, whatever the problems, we haven't had people storming uh, the, uh, our, our parliament house uh, after an election. Uh, we, I think, need to be really cautious about making sure 
that uh, Australians who are doing it tough are able to see uh, more security uh, in their work, are able to, uh, to have what they need to be able to save for a home and to plan a family. And some of the, the casualisation in the workforce can be a good thing. Uh, for many people, that's an option. Provides flexibility, good for business, good for individuals. Uh, but I do think we need to make sure that the system works for business and works for workers. And the other thing that I want to see, and I, I think we've seen this since the election, uh, the, the legislation that passed the parliament last year. I'm not aware of any mass breakout of general strikes in Australia since then. Now, that was something that was predicted, you know, the, by, by some. Um, it hasn't happened. Uh, we think that uh, productivity bargaining is really important. Uh, I spoke about this before the election at the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, speech. There was too much focus on, on gotchas during that campaign rather than serious speeches. Um, and, uh, and, and contributions and some of the policy analysis that went on. Um, but, it, but it is important. That issue of secure work is an issue out there. And if you don't get on top of it, it can get, it can get away from you. OK. Well, it is, it is always, as always, with these things, a balance. Um, sure. And you know, to pay people, you have to make money and you know, have a, a profitable economy. We've, and I support, I, I very much see that, um, you know, and I've spoken about this for a long period of time, uh, for some time uh, cop some, uh, some criticism for doing it uh, right. in my own ranks. <laughs> uh, but, you know, business and unions have common interests. How do we have a system, and that's where I refer to the, the, the Hawke-Keating legacy, that common interest in how we drive productivity, drive business growth, you know, I, I say the same thing, by the way, to a business group that I say to unions. You can't have trade union members if you don't have successful businesses. And, and, and one of the other things I, I say to the, the, the BCA and others uh, I've said for a long period of time as well, is that the most likely uh, venue to find a trade unionist is in a big business. Uh, there is a, an incentive there for both uh, to have uh, to work together uh, for common interests. Okay. Well, we, we, we did do a poll um, in the lead up to this summit and published the results today, and it's 47%, roughly half of businesses across small, medium, large fear a recession within the next 12 months. The Reserve Bank Board is meeting this afternoon and widely tipped to push up rates, I think, for the 10th consecutive time. Uh, do you subscribe? I mean, what, what's your view? Are you, are you worried about recession or do you think we can skate through? What's your message? Uh, you can never skate through, and that's well. part of my message today, Re. You, you need to actually be active and on the front foot for growth. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic, frankly. Um, the kind of person I am <laughs> help, helps to get up in the morning and be optimistic, but, but I am. I, I, I think that uh, this difficult period we're going through of dealing with supply chain shortages, uh, dealing with the transition in energy that we're seeing across the economy, uh, dealing with the impact of the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, dealing with all of this. We have our eye on the immediate challenges. What do we need to do immediately, right now? So last December is the best example of that, that you've seen with uh, price caps that wouldn't have been envisaged as being possible, let alone being done in partnership with Liberal state governments such as here in New South Wales. Um, so you deal with the immediate crisis, uh, but you set yourself up for the medium and long term. And I think we can do that. Um, I think business in so many areas has been just uh, ahead of government over a long period of, of, of time. Uh, on energy, on gender, on, on growth, on trade, on all of these areas. You know, I, I genuinely listened to, to, uh, to Mike's speech 
th this morning, there is nothing that Mike Henry said that, that is different from where the government positions ourselves. Nothing, you, not a word. Do you have any, any proposals or ideas how you could facilitate the role of business? I go back to the last budget. Your predecessor uh, handed down before the election and the theme of that was very much a business-led recovery. It's not dissimilar to the themes you outlined today, but that's, that was sort of spoke about measures to stimulate business investment. It yeah, but, sort of more... but they all ran out on May 21. Right, OK. That, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's the sure. truth. Uh, absolutely. Um, and, and one of the things we've had to inherit in terms of our budget um, is that um, so many measures stop on July 1. Um, you know, there were, there were these fiscal time bombs there. You know, for all the talk about Alice Springs, community services funding stopped, stopped on July 1, ran off. The funding for, to give another um, example uh, that will be of concern to the business community, uh, the whole um, e-safety issue uh, and Commissioner and all of that work that Julie Inman Grant uh, is doing a fantastic job in, funding stops. Like, is the program going to stop then? We're going to find money for all of that as well. Um, and, and that is something that the ERC has been grappling with. That's the context of us coming up with a very modest change, uh, supported by the Fin Review, I must say, um, on, on super. Um, you have to be able to do some things uh, in the economy uh, to set things up rather than just occupy the space and be scared off any, any reform at all. And you part of what, what uh, you know, we, we will be looking at is ways uh, in which we can uh, do more to facilitate uh, business activity. That's, and in part, though, is what the safeguard mechanism is about. Uh, that's what the skills agenda is about. Uh, that's what uh, so much of the, the reforms uh, that we're putting forward uh, are, are doing. Childcare reform is, is about that as well, uh, at a considerable cost to government. That's the largest on budget cost. Uh, but we'll look at other things as well. And uh, the relationship with business um, I find incredibly constructive. Uh, the delegation to India is such a serious delegation and my door is open uh, to the business community at all times. You did mention super and you have dipped your toe in the water uh, in the last week or so with that. Is, and of course quite a ruckus for, as you said, a relatively minor change. Is, are you comp is that sort of the end of it for reform, tax reform, this side of the next election, or tax changes? Do you, th or do you think it's getting too difficult now to even do a, more, a comprehensive package? Everyone speaks about the need for reform, but once you get down into details, it, it quickly bogs down. Oh, OK. What are your plans? For, and sorry, and if I may add, you, you got a very positive reaction in news poll to that. Does, does that embolden you to maybe uh, have another crack at something else? Well, reform is difficult because you have... Um you know, we have, we have a parliament that's difficult. We have a parliament that is empowering the crossbenchers because uh, the opposition just say no to everything, even their own policies. Um, so that, that makes it difficult. Uh, we are determined there's a reason why we put in place the changes don't come in until 2025. Uh, so we cover off on the argument uh, over uh, over uh, what was said before the election. Uh, but what we said then was very honest as well, uh, which is that, uh, you know, we didn't know. I wasn't aware someone, maybe they're in this room, whoever's got the half a billion dollars in super, if you can put up your <laughs> hand, everyone's really interested <laughs> in, uh, in who it is. Uh, the 17 people who've got 100 mil, um, when you get briefed by Treasury about that, um, you've got a responsibility to, to act. That, that problem did exist before the election. Yep. If you were aware of it, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, so I hadn't seen it reported anywhere. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that was the, the, the 
the advice uh, that uh, that we got. And when you look at um, the purpose of super, it was very clear uh, that that's not the purpose of superannuation. So it was a worthwhile uh, reform uh, to do. But uh, I'll disappoint you, Phil, and say that there's no big announcements on, on new policy uh, on, on tax uh, coming here. OK. Look, just finally, we're almost out of time. You're off to India tomorrow? Tomorrow? Uh, we head to Perth uh, to pre-position tonight for hmm. a flight to arrive uh, tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Well, as we know, the purpose of the visit is to try and crack new new export opportunities. It's been going for a while, I think, um, since the Varghese report and so forth. But I guess of interest to people in this room, what what odds do you give of a trip to China this year for yourself, given the rapprochement that's happened in the last six months? Do you think it's, there's a likelihood? Um, would you like to go? Yeah. Oh, look, I've said that uh, if there's an invite, then I, I, would, I would accept that. Uh, I think it's been a good thing uh, that the relationship uh, has got more stable. Uh, we uh, want a more stable, secure region. And I've said we'll, we'll cooperate with China where we can, we'll disagree where we must, uh, but will engage in, in our national interest. <coughs> and they are our major trading partner. So we do have an interest there. And we also have an interest in uh, mature uh, relationship. What uh, Kurt Campbell from the US speaks about, a return to diplomacy. You know, stopping the loud hailer. Uh, frankly, uh, use of international diplomacy to send domestic political messages is what we saw towards the end of the previous government. Um, that wasn't about Australia's national interest or about our security, it was about sending a message here. And uh, we, uh, through Penny Wong, uh, who's worked uh, incredibly hard and I think is, is a sensational uh, foreign minister, um, I think that the relationships are being better. One of the things that we haven't done though is flag things because that changes the dynamic of the power relationship if uh, we say, if I flag a, uh, a desire. Um, we'll, we'll just deal with it on, on, it, on its merits, but we'll deal with, uh, with China recognising that there are differences there. We have different political systems, we have different values. Uh, but will engage in a constructive and mature way uh, because that's in the interest too of Australian jobs and in the interests of China as well. I say this, it's in Australia's interest to export to China, but it's in China's interest to receive the magnificent products uh, that we produce uh, here in Australia as well.